hi everyone thank you so much uh for being here we're very very excited um of course the the ponder club uh has been uh you know an amalgamation of lots of different things and we're really looking forward to sharing lots of interesting things with you today but also in the weeks coming um ahead um i'm going to start by introducing myself uh and then everybody else on the ponder team club can um go for it uh and do introductions to themselves as well uh my name is surubhi i am based out of gurgaon uh i currently work as a nutrition and behavior consultant uh i recently graduated uh from a uh, bach uh with the with a backbed diploma uh and i'm really really excited to be here and just meet all of you and have some really incredible conversations um i'm going to tag sadhana Hi Surbhi, thank you so much, and hi everybody. And uh, I am Saujanya, and I'm based out of Bangalore. I am a canine behavior consultant, graduated from Vax. Uh, I've been practicing for some time now, and I'm so glad to have this interaction and this platform for all of us to, you know, just ponder along. I guess, uh, and maybe Ahana because Sindhu. I don't know if anyone needs introduction to Sindhu here. Uh, I think Ahana can take over. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Ahana. I'm not yet a canine behavior consultant, but I am working towards it. And uh, I'm a backward student hoping to graduate this year. I live in Chennai with my two dogs, Loki and Kitty, and I'm also just like really excited to be doing this with all of you here. So yes, take it away, Sindhu. Okay. Uh, all right. So. <clears throat> Hi everyone. I'm Sindhur. Uh, I am the director of Box. Um, I used to work as a canine behavior consultant and a canine myotherapist, but now um, I teach more than I, I don't. I don't really consult. I teach, and uh, I'm doing my masters in anthrozoology. So research and teaching is where I'm at. Um, recruits to fight in Ukraine. Eight hundred and ten hours. So. Uh, Surabhi, uh, do you want me to continue or this is sufficient? <laughs> okay. No, I think, I think you can start us off. Yeah. Okay, great. So I want to, uh, briefly tell you all what this is about. Uh, for the longest time, I have wanted to interact more with people. Um, a lot of people have been asking me, you know, that we want more live interaction. We want to talk to you guys. And I have not had the bandwidth to actually do that. Uh, I've been... Uh, <clears throat> just it's it's just a lot to deal with so just teaching the 101 and the backbed course has overwhelmed me and i know that that has not been enough um, really the interest that a lot of you have shown in terms of getting to know learn it's just humbling i just i'm so touched by it and i felt terrible that i have not been able to meet you guys and talk to you and things like that so now with the new graduates that we have and the new students that we have, I think it's a golden opportunity for us to work together to work, bring something like this to you. Um, so what Ponder Club is, and also we want to bring this to you at no cost. It is something that we have wanted to do. It's just, it's been so difficult for us to put something together, but we I've known in my heart that this is something that I wanted to do too. So, this is a no cost uh, offering from Box. Uh, what it is, what it should be is I think really something I want all of you to drive. We're going to start out with some ideas. We're going to be doing live sessions. The Backbed students are going to be driving it and I'm so proud of them uh, for they worked very hard to bring this to you and uh, I'll make sure that they work very hard to continue to bring some awesome stuff for you. Um, but uh, we're only guessing here on what it is that you might want. The truth is that we want to hear from you what you want. How do we use this platform? Uh, what we have given the access to technology and the limitations of technology. What can we bring to you that's of interest? Just, you know, use as many as you'd like uh, through the entire conversation today. That's always really helpful and encouraging for us as hosts as well. Um, so I think the idea is to try and just keep it as engaging as possible, as interactive as possible. 
Thank you, Sindhur, for role modeling and demonstrating that. Um, amazing. Uh, so I think we can sort of get started. Like Sindhur said, we have a packed agenda. We wanted to start off really zoomed out and talk about a couple of, um, you know, incredible stories um, that we have found along the journey. Um, and I'm going to now pass it over to Saujanya to take over. Thank you, Surbi. Thank you, Sindhur, for introducing. So I guess we'll just jump right in and then uh, start with the videos. What we are going to do is we're going to share the video here, but we'll also put in the YouTube link just in case you miss out the video here or you're unable to hear what, what is going on. And after that, we can have a discussion about each of the cases and the stories we hear. Okay, just give me a second while I do that. Okay, are you all able to see my screen? Perfect. So I, I guess we are ready to start with the first story. Okay. Yeah, my name is Achna. Um, we uh, adopted Leo three and a half years ago. Uh, we did know he had a bit of a traumatic past. I mean, everything was a, a trigger for him. And, uh, you know, when we got him initially, anything and everything, he would start barking ferociously. It was aggressive bark. If we stood behind the door, he didn't like it. Um, he bit my children. He bit my husband. He bit a lot of people. Um, when he bit my younger son really badly, we were like, okay, no, this is it. We, we can't handle him. I don't know what to do. We, we were extremely clueless pet parents. Um, so we somebody recommended this boarding place, boarding slash training place. Um, but we left him there because we were too scared to have him home. Uh, you know, he was biting everybody. He was going off on everyone. He, everything, like I said, was a trigger. Even just getting into the car was a trigger. And for us, we thought all of those individual problems had to be solved. We didn't realize there was a much larger issue that we had to take care of. Um, we would, we were allowed to visit him once a week over there. And it was just heartbreaking you know the the intuition in you tells you that no this is not right it's not working he just got sick um you could t see he was shutting down his uh, they had like this really heavy metal chain around his neck we kept him there for a month and we couldn't after that we couldn't see him go through this anymore we just got him back in less than a month we said we'll figure something else out uh, the then we tried two different trainers one trainer said oh you know what uh, you're pampering him too much. Um, he's very attached to me. So if he comes close to you, you should kick him away. Then we got another trainer. That chap said, oh, again, he's a bully. You know, he's a dominant dog. Um, he wants to bully everybody. He wants to go up the hierarchy in this. You know, he's he's a he weighs 14 kgs. I weigh 60 kgs and he's trying to dominate me. That didn't sound right. So we were kind of, at that point, extremely frustrated, helpless. Um, his behavior hadn't changed. We thought, okay, maybe, you know, I, I take up some courses online and, and learn all about different kinds of training, maybe do a sit and a rollover and, a, and you know, all of those kind of things. We tried all that. His behavior didn't change. It just was frustrating to him. It was frustrating to us. Yes. Then finally, um, my friend, my very good friend, who is actually a clinical psychologist for children, she recommended Barks. At Barks, um, it was life changing. Um, intuitive, it was intuitive. It was almost like, why didn't I think of this before? This is exactly what I should have learned. You know, this was what I'm a mother of two, and I would never, if a child is crying, I would never say, you know, Sh push that child away. Uh, he's just being crazy, you know, just push him away or whatever. You'd run to your child, you'd do all of those things. And Barks was very similar, you know, those kind of things where they teach you various methods to cope with. And um, and now here is this dog. My God, we, we've even taken him on trips, taken him on beach trips. We've taken him on several trips. We even take him to restaurants, but we know what kind of restaurants to go to. So we've learned what he likes, what he doesn't like. He likes certain dogs. He has a best friend now who's a dog. Initially, before Barks, every dog, every human was a threat to him. Um, you, he would see a dog a mile away and he would bark, aggressively barking. Um, 
now he's learned to you know what i see a dog that's really far away i will continue to sniff um i don't need to be threatened if the dog does come into his space if he does feel threatened yes he will bark but what i've realized is if we leave him in a place that doesn't have too many dogs and he's off leash he handles it beautifully his state of mind is his presence of mind is there that you know no i don't need to bite now i can just communicate to them and they under seem to understand how was that story uh i think what sticks out for me about the story <clears throat> and it's a very touching one right it's been stuck with me for a very long time and it's touching for me because uh the lessons learned by the the human there um is very precious so she's kind of learned most importantly not to fix the situation right it's not fix the dog or oh, the dog is biting get the dog not to bite the dog is finding everybody a threat get them not to you know turn him into a friendly dog like that it doesn't seem to be her end goal at all she's quite happy with the fact that the dog still seems to see people as a threat or uh, other dogs as a threat uh, of course to a much lesser degree but is able to actually say i see you as a threat but i don't see the need to escalate i can walk away and i think that conversation that nuance that difference is something that we don't bring out in a lot of uh, you know training uh, con you know conversations in general discourse in general because it's always about let's somehow return this individual back to this idealistic we were recently having this conversation right the idea of a good dog the idea of a good person this such an idealistic uh, picture and we want to struggle so hard to return to that rather than figure out this is where the dog is at and how do we just give the dogs the tool the individual the tool to cope with the burden that they carry this dog has had trauma there's going to be lifelong impact one way or the other what and that's the same for human beings right i have had trauma and i'm never going to be perfect but if i can have the tools to figure out to deal with where i'm at i think that would be way more precious than trying to fix me true i think i mean i totally agree i think recently i not recently maybe a year ago i had like a major downtime in my mental health phase and i almost had like a breakdown saying why am i not getting cured of my anxiety and then it it just hit me that we don't look at our like when we work with our dogs in the box way we don't look at it in the same way we talk about coping skills we talk about progress in the healthy manner uh, or you know what what might be the small step progress i think surbhi spoke about this recently in her talk and uh, in the dog centered care group that it's not 0 to 100 right like even small step progress is progress and then it made me realize that it's okay to have anxiety but as long as you know you have the tools to cope with it that's that's the larger picture and that's the bigger you know goal to have uh, in in that case um yeah surbhi ahana anything to add and we have some amazing comments as well yeah i think for me like i think what um and 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 i could see a couple of reactions to that as well right i think what was very uh, heartbreaking to hear but also i think it's so common is when somebody is told oh you're pampering your dog too much right uh, and shifts this kind of blame onto the caregiver onto the guardian onto the guardian is to saying that certain behaviors of your especially like behaviors that are anchored in connection and love are leading your dog to behave a certain way right and i and i find it i mean i just think that we never do that with humans right if i knew that you have been through trauma i mean i would just focus all of my energy on making you feel safe and giving you that love and giving you that support as opposed to like pushing you down a line where there are you know consequences and and, and rules and all of that right so i i think that i think just that approach and and very similar to what sindhu said i think a lot of conventional training i think misses out on that conversation um and so yeah i think i was just thinking a little bit about that yeah ahana anything uh, yeah i think what i kind of related the most to this was like the frustration you feel when the training doesn't work because like i've been there when you're trying to like train or behavior into the dog but it's not happening because the dog is kind of not in that emotional state or mental state to accept the training but you think 
you know, there's something wrong with the dog that they're not kind of responding to the training. Why aren't you sitting? Why aren't you healing? And that also kind of just like fractures the whole relationship that you have with the dog. You kind of start, I don't know, not being able to see eye to eye with the dog. And it just, you just go like into a really bad space. Yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, if you, I think even I have tried like a lot of other ways and trying to, you know, figure out helping, of course, not so much into aversive methods, but even then, right, you're, if you're not taking dog's perspective, what is going on? The underlying reasons, I feel like we keep come, running in circles, not knowing where we are going at all with the with the entire situation. So, yeah, I, I think we are all able to see different perspectives of the same situation. And I just want to read out a few of the comments and then play. Uh, I, I, Sanjana, mean, I want to add something to this. Uh, this you mentioned, um, you know, the, your kind of closing statement of what you said earlier was, um, I have anxiety uh, and it's okay to have anxiety as long as I have the necessary tools to cope. And I think it's really important to know, know um, and this is very early <clears throat> sort of discussion, I've seen in very few places, but the uh, I've, um, Joseph Lodo talks about this in his book. Um, the book is titled Anxiety. Um, and it's at the very last few chapters of the book. So it's a book that you have to suffer through. But then the last chapters that talk about how to deal with anxiety and he talks about all the things that don't work right he's talking about ptsd and all the things that don't work um so, uh, or have sort of limited success and you know uh, side effects and so medication and talk therapy and all of that come under that but of the things that do work is a very interesting one which is active avoidance so i think and this is something that i see repeatedly even with my own anxiety journey is that the and 20 years I've been in therapy and medication and whatnot. But finally, what's making a difference for me is when I'm able to take control and say, I know how to deal with this. Somehow it starts mitigating the anxiety, mitigating from a perspective of and think about it, right? Most of us who have anxiety have anxiety about the anxiety. So it starts, you know, 10 steps early, right? I know I have social anxiety. So I start feeling anxious even before I have to go to that event. It's not at the event that I have. But that starts mitigating because you are now saying, I know how to deal with that situation. And therefore, that part at least starts mitigating. I may not get to zero anxiety, but there is a dramatic reduction. One that, you know, no amount of medication, no amount of therapy has actually got me through to that but knowing that I, so I think it's 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 important for us when we say when we say it's you know it's it's okay for us to hold on to anxiety but you know coping skills is what we need I think a lot of people make the assumption that what we're saying is this, uh, you know you're just going to live with it no this gets better it gets better in its own way it's promising it's just definitely worth trying I think that's the same for dogs as well as what I feel yeah true um and thank you for adding that in. I, of course, we didn't want to have any kind of confusion about letting the anxiety be or letting the the suffering be. It's not that, you know, that's not, that's not the final message of the conversation at all. Um, okay, do we read the comments or do we go ahead and then take in questions about this? Or do you want to go with the next uh, case, next story? We can yeah, I think Sajana, yeah, I think we can also like look at some of the questions that came that came from right, right, right. And, right. Uh, okay, so I think some one of the questions that I think is is I think relevant on this thread here, um, was, and I'm gonna I, I'm gonna say the person's name just so that if they're there, then you know they know that they hopefully got some answers, some reflection. Um, okay, I think it was Ankita who talked about just tips to to manage anxious, manage an anxious dog. I think that's what she was asking. And I can see Ankita nodding. So Ankita is here. Yeah. I think one of the great ones that Sindhu already mentioned while, you know, addressing the coping bits of it was the anxiety avoidance. But that's, I don't think that... I, Again, we are, we are not talking about consultation or giving advice, but I think a big part of working around the anxiety is definitely, you know, anxiety avoidance. But tips is very hard to talk about without we, we knowing what really is going on with the dog. What do you think, Surbhi, Sindhur, Ahana, about this? 
so i'm going to pull my card of you know being the, the, the director and i will talk first okay <laughs> so, um so I, i of course we can't get specific but i think the general structure and you know some of the comments coming in already talk about that right yeah. silky has mentioned um uh, uh the idea of being in the moment now how do we get a dog to be in the moment i can't teach the dog meditation and say you know 5 minute meditation app but what are the activities that allow them and watch watch with your eyes it's there what are the activities that are getting them to zoom like crazy or move fast and what is the one that's getting them to slow down and concentrate typically we see things like giving them things to explore giving them things to sniff giving them things to chew on uh giving them surfaces to walk on that are not flat uh ahana has a fabulous video ahana if you have it up send the link otherwise we can send it on the group later uh just you know setting up of different uh, surfaces where the dogs have to pick up you know and walk on and things like that <clears throat> and it doesn't seem like it has anything to do with anxiety uh why would walking over a broom or a shelf have anything to do with anxiety it doesn't make sense right but i'll give you another way to look at it lot of yoga practices have to do with balance and they help with reduction of anxiety balance exercises with their yeah. amazing amount of proprioceptive input tends to reduce anxiety and increase focus and there's a lot of neurochemical stuff there that we don't have to get into but the real life example that we see repeatedly is yoga it's a great example so i think things like that so on one hand what are the activities to add on the other hand avoidance what are the things to remove anything that has to do with the dog getting very hyper very excited even something as simple as you coming home and going hey, versus hi who's a puppy both have love but one gets the dog excited one gets the dog just feeling that love and that's the you know that's the thing so and of course uh, what a consultation will do for you is a consultant will come in and look at your entire life and map this out for you to say okay this 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 please don't do this 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 given your home these are the things you can do and uh again there was a comment somewhere you know about gut health so health in general can cause issues so trying to analyze that pain chronic pain try to analyze that i think that those things can be taken care of and a consultant will do but generally these are the principles that we repeatedly tell people and i think we will touch upon this over and over because this is really the structure of it yeah absolutely and i think like i also think like just building off of what both both of you said i think for me even in my own journey with anxiety right i think what's just been really helpful is to think about how do i just regulate my nervous system and what are different things i and i can do to be able to do that right um and when i'm feeling dysregulated do i have access again to be able to find comfort find you know calmness uh find a space of just feeling safe right um and i think again a lot of that translates then to to what we do with with dogs as well uh okay. but before we move on to the next video i did want to make a quick chhoto announcement um okay so a big part of uh accessing the goodies uh through the live is actually to take pictures of the event and then share them on your social media channels um and tag us and use a few hashtags i'll put all of that down but i realized as soon as the video started that i forgot to tell people to take photographs of the event so just remember to take photographs uh, so that you can uh, enjoy all the goodies the rest of the information and anything we put in the chat and we we'll sort of repeat and reinforce through the event yeah back to you sajan now Okay so uh, we Sajanya, let me just add one more thing this is a topic that we talk about a lot so i think it's worth kind of slipping it in and it's again a very deep long topic but uh, with have with things like anxiety and fear secure attachment and for those of you who are followers on social media i've been sharing a lot of content on secure attachment and secure attachment is not one of those what is step 1 step 2 step 3 kind of a thing it's a very very it depends a lot on um meeting emotional needs being there and how do you do that is is a very personalized thing you have to figure it as you go along it's a slow journey everything about bucks is slow <laughs> you know so not nothing we do in a hurry but 
keep that in mind read up about it anything that and any literature you find on children there are parallels you can draw to dogs because they are cognitively very similar they attach very similarly to human beings there are studies that show that so you can start applying those things and you'll get a long long way but focus on the the concept of secure attachment and connections okay thank you sandur for that uh, addition as well i think that is a great important foundation of just building relationship with our dogs that we focus so much in the box way. So I'm moving to the next story and okay, can you all see my screen? Just a thumbs up just so that, okay, great. So hi, my name is Roma and I've got two furries like Indies, uh, Marvel, my elder one just turned four and this Sufi, my younger one is about three and a half. And Sufi came to us when, uh, you know, she lost her eyesight. So Marvel, I think uh, she, was, she was my first rescue. And, uh, you know, uh, the thing was that she came in as a very unwell child and, uh, you know, she never got adopted. So when she was around four, you know, nobody could stand near her food bowl. Like even if you're walking past, there was aggression. Like she would just lunge. Um, then um, there was this the car issue I told you that she would you know yank 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 and she will tear up the seat cover so something which uh, you know I was not able to understand extreme fear of things like no no unknown person can enter the house for her it was like this person god knows what will they do and in all that she would just raise all her fangs up and at a distance she will show the person i'm going to charge at you if you approach now with all her you know teeth showing and everything so it used to be like fearful for people i understand that uh, when you leash her so then she would go on like you know on her front paws in the air and lunging at that person so all these behaviors were there when i had the trainer for her and the crate training her distrust with me had gone so much that one day she felt so threatened with me she bit my hand and she bit my hand badly and that was that point of time you know a lot of people told me that you really need to give up this dog this is an aggressive dog and this doesn't work she's really trying to be the alpha it had reached a point for me where i would tell people you know don't come home because you know we'll not be able to talk and she and it was more than me it was more like she gets you know she would be so tired by the end of it because you know if somebody is there for two hours she will take a break again she will bark she will take a break again she will bark so it was mentally taxing for her also uh, i can say that i was better prepared for sufi but even then like that one week was very taxing because you know two dogs and both are trying to adjust to each other one recently you know she's lost her vision so she's trying to navigate the world uh, in a different way current situation with marvel is she's much more cooperative um uh, even walks for that matter you know walks with her used to be again because you know lunging and barking so what i realized is a, a long leash works with her and even if there is somebody around as long as she's on a long leash she's not bothered she will do something she will go behind the bush or she will just curve which was not the case when she was on a short leash and she will just look at me if i'm observing her or watching her and then just one hand of reassurance she will get back to you know doing whatever she does and if she feels she really needs me then she will come running to me so so and there are a lot of these situations house help you know just telling them you know avoid the gaze don't interact with her just keep walking and she and then after a week she herself goes and approaches them and then they are like happy okay she's come to us but simple things where i'm not interfering not seeing a threat like barks it just gave me like the guidance that you know these are the ways you can do it and now you figure it out for your dog for example her food thing so i remember during the 101 only i had discussed this during the class and i was asked to share a video of her eating and i remember anushri at that point of time pointed out that you know you might have to try different things roma but you know just try giving her a little elevated surface to eat the food and let her decide the height that she is comfortable with and i tried that and you know i realized that probably you know there was pain in the 
area when she's bending and eating and that could have led to her getting upset that you know i'm trying to finish the food and there's pain and that completely kind of i saw that it kind of stopped so it is just the bowl elevation that i did for her and this confidence that she won't bite anybody came later okay so these were after i tried like all these little little things and i and i realized split works for her and all that she's more trusting of humans is what i would say she still takes her time to know a new person she'll not go bagging her tail she'll sit at a distance and observe but we've reached a phase where she sits at a distance and observes and doesn't go barking 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 <laughs> okay anything to add what are your thoughts i think probably i just want to add one thing that she has discussed a few things that work for her dog but every dog is different so i guess that's one caveat that we want to add uh, more or less with most cases here um, but yeah okay so <clears throat> um some things stand out for me right one is um you know she does and for those of us who have done the 101 we realize how many different things she's actually doing but for those of us who people who haven't done it you probably hardly heard anything right like she said what happened before she said what happened after but what happened in between but she actually said a lot of it it's so deceptively simple really you know one might wonder why going from a short leash to a long leash why should that make a difference uh, surely there has been some training in between but the, these are the things when they come together and i think the other thing is the example that she gave was a very powerful one right and this is something that that is the devil in the detail that's the beautiful devil in the detail right is that dog who was biting people when she was eating her food our solution was not to say we'll train the dog we will you know de counter condition the dog so on and so forth our solution was to say try elevating the bowl for that dog like saujanya said it may have worked for another dog it may not and that's kind of where the trial and error and you know the full repertoire of knowledge is necessary but that i for detail don't rush into fixing things don't don't blindly do things right watch what could be going on what could be going on that should kind of keep you up at night right what is it that could be going on it's not a bad dog um and i think uh, that that mindset is what is common across people who come to box that willingness to say i'm willing to sit and you know keep myself up at night to really try and figure that out so this this was a really nice story for me to hear I had full flashbacks of my story with mutton, um, and so we've actually done a case study on that, and there's snippets of that uh, on the box page as well. But I think so much of what she said, um, you know, rang true for my experience with with mutton as well. Um, and I think that I I think that what I think my heart also goes out to 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 dog. caregivers who are in situations like these because i think that the more problematic or more terrifying the behaviors are i feel like i feel like they're advised to like take escalated methods of training um you know and so for example i think she spoke about she spoke about pre training for example uh and i know sindhu has done a talk on pre training uh as well and i i just feel like i think for me that was that was a really big moment right to saying that the more terrifying behaviors the higher or the more severe form of training is required or we amp the um you know we amp the what we think the dog needs in that moment which has a much more negative impact than than what it does right and i think again if we if we go back to so much of the literature on children and you know and difficult behaviors like what what they need in that moment is just like safety and connection and space uh and someone to just try and understand why are they behaving the way that they are right um so i think that was something that that resonated with me uh i also think uh just it's important to kind of remember that the situation doesn't like remain the same like there's like a lot of fluidity to it like for example when she brought in a second dog because that's kind of what ha happened to me like very recently what worked with me and loki in the past like they 
the thing just shifted when Kitty came into the picture and then you have to kind of work at new ways of figuring out how to manage the situation and you know manage it for Loki manage for Kitty and like your dogs and yeah just kind of keep changing with the times basically um so one thing we can do, Sajani, there are a bunch of questions, so maybe we can take those very nice questions. But also, I'd love to offer, we did a AMA as part of the auditorium. So for people who have done 101, we have an auditorium uh, every month. We do three live events. And uh, Ahana did bring the question of low, low, Loki and Loki and Kitty uh, into the AMA and uh, we have the recording of it. So I'll share that as well because we did a deep dive on it. So maybe there'll be stories there. As you can see, we don't have step one, step two, step three. It's all somebody asked, right? A lot of trial and error, a lot of case by case, absolutely 100%. And so I think more cases we share, maybe something will click, some idea will click. And that's probably a better way to go than us trying to give you like a cookie cutter one size fits all solution yeah i think i i want to take the uh questions there are a couple of them uh but before that i felt, felt like there was something that uh she mentioned which was how marvel stopped trusting her uh through the process and uh that's such a big a factor when we are working with our dogs uh, because a lot of times when we are not looking at what the dog needs and when we are looking at just trying to mend the behavior, I guess, constantly the dogs are losing their trust in what they see as their caregiver figure, that human, you know, who's supposed to be there for them. So I feel like there's that kind of stood out for me in terms of how the dog lost the trust uh, in the initial period. And I think, um, if I remember correctly, she mentions how the trust factor increased quite a bit over time when, you know, she mentioned about the dog wanting to come and then stand next to her and letting her handle situations. I feel like that's a huge thing, especially when we are talking about secure attachment, reassurance and building relationship with our dogs. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm, so yeah. Then, do you want me to read out the questions? And then, yeah. Okay. So the first one that came in was, um, this is by Nutpack. I think this is somebody called Shivani, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how does one build reassurance? Um, I, I okay. I think the theme that will repeat over and over. Maybe we should put it on the back here, as it'll depend on the dog. <laughs> so you know. Um, but um, of course, at Barks we talk about a few hand signals and things like that. She talks about the idea of splitting. These are all body language based things. Um, and that we can't cover all of that here. But in general, I think building reassurance, building trust is showing that I will show up for you. If you're scared, I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm going to acknowledge it. Something as simple, I'll give you a really simple example, right? If my dog is barking at something outside, I'm not going to ask her to shut up. I'm not going to ignore her. I'm going to tell her, I hear you. I know there's a problem. And I might even go look outside and come back and say, everything's fine. It's all show. I know there is nothing uh, really scary outside probably there is a cat or something like that okay that's that's her thing but taking that into consideration her point of view into consideration uh i see in a lot of dogs turn and look back at their humans and this is something that has been studied there's so much studies on this that dogs tend to look back on humans when there is a difficult problem it's a genetic thing that they do uh so they look back at you pay attention to that maybe it will occur to you what what you should be telling the dog the dog is going to turn and look at you most of us don't even realize that and so we don't respond to that the dog is turning and saying hey will you help me and we are somewhere else so just paying attention to that and in the moment i think you'll realize what is the help the dog needs it may be uh, you can work a lot with body language something as simple as it's okay you're okay they're masters at reading body language. So you can try something like that. You can try with your voice. You can try with your um, facial expressions and things like that. You can look at ideas like splitting that Tura talks about in her book. I talk about it as well. Uh, and yeah, at our consultations in 101, we talk about hand signals and things like that. So those are a little bit more effective and advanced, but the general principles are somewhat like this. I think just showing up what you mentioned, I think uh, reassurance, I would just summarize as showing up in whatever different ways for our dogs. 
because recently I've had like major shift in my lifestyle. We've, I've moved homes with my dogs and, you know, I'm living with my husband and my younger dog, Zoe, she has major separation anxiety, especially when he's exiting the house and everything. And I remember this one day she was sitting at the gate and then she was looking out, waiting for him to come in. And I just sat there, I was reading my book and I was just looking at her and I'm like, you know, it's okay. I'm here, you know, till you want to sit here, you want to come in, I'm ready for it. And I think it's been two weeks since, you know, I've been like showing up whenever this has happened. And today she sleeps in the room when he's not around completely, you know, able to cope with the situation. So I feel like reassurance is so many different things, but I think it sums up in like showing up for your dog, I guess. Yeah. Can I just like add a really tiny point to that as well? Um, I also feel like for me, like when, again, when I was doing um, the parks courses and we were talking about reassurance I think for me what really resonated was just I think acknowledging what your dog is feeling right like I think it to me like it really just starts there uh and it's almost like saying you know I tell someone I'm feeling scared and that other person comes back and says no you're not feeling scared you know it's like just acknowledge that I am feeling something and you may not understand it you may not think that it's as big for it's as big a deal as it is but just acknowledge it um, and then, of course, the showing up and then everything else that follows. But I think that so much of the lack of reassurance also happens because, you know, when you when you hear your dog bark at something, you're like, it's nothing to bark about, right? But there is something for the dog to bark about, right? And how do we just acknowledge that to begin with? Um, so, yeah. Okay, I'm going to take the next question. Um, Kritika is asking, what was the bowl elevation method? Was Marvel finishing the food very fast because of some chronic pain? Rajne, you worked with Roma, right? You should know. No? Ah, okay. She's done this all on her own. So I, I don't exactly know what the issue was with Roma's dog was because she came into class and went away. But one of the things we do see with a lot, a lot, a lot of dogs is neck issues because a lot of dogs have hind leg issues and hip issues. And so when they have that, they tend to overload on their front shoulders, which gives them neck issues. Uh, Julia has a very interesting way of saying it. She's like dogs walk on their neck. Um, you know, we don't, our front paws, the one that's connected to the neck is not involved in movement for dogs. It is. So many, many of them have neck issues. And so many of them can struggle with, uh, dipping their neck to get food from their bowl. So just elevating that can make a huge difference. Just think about how it would, what mode you would be in if you're in pain every time you have to eat, you're hungry as hell, but the act of eating is causing pain. And the neck muscles are connected to the head muscles, which means that it's not only a pain in the neck, but it's also, you know, it's going to give you a headache, a jaw pain. They're all, you know, they're connected. Um, and so it can lead to, ex you know, very intense uh, food related uh, um, aggression kind of a thing or reactivity kind of a thing. Uh, and so we just try different heights at which the dog seems to be comfortable. Uh, again, if, we're just getting feedback from the dog to see what they seem to be comfortable with. And that's what. Cool. Um, I'm going to take the next one. If, yeah. Okay. Kalindi is asking, I gather that there is a lot of trial and error in trying to help the pup. Would that be correct? I think there was a response to that also, right? Why don't you pick up both yeah. end? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So um, the response to this was not sure if I will call it trial and error as much as trying to understand the dog. Like one of my friends noticed how I was responding to my dog when he was barking. She said, it is much like trying to figure out why a baby is crying. Uh, Kalindi, does that answer your question? Yep. Amazing. Awesome. Um, okay. The next one was, uh, what about uh, trust and reassurance between two dogs? Uh, this is again from the nut pack. Reassurance and trust between two dogs in a multi-dog household between the dogs. Absolutely get what you are saying with the connect with humans. Uh, this is uh, quite a challenging one because it really now boils down to not one, but two personalities plus, you know, everybody in the house. So it will depend on what is causing a lack of trust. But mm -hmm. I think, again, you know, the things we spoke about in terms of anxiety, the ability to walk away from conflict, to know that, you know, you're, you are safe the other dog is never going to be in a situation where they're going to be hurting you. So my number one tip for anybody with a multi-dog household, number one tip 
you know, basic starting point, feed them separately into separate rooms with a visual barrier between the two. Because usually 99.9% .9 of the times, the tension between dogs in homes I've seen is the bone of contention, like literally, right? There is a bone and the two dogs want to get at it. Even with streeties, we see this. One of Some of the only times they get into fight, either it's because there's a dog in heat or around food otherwise they don't this otherwise no reason for them so it and again there are studies that show that you know agonistic behavior appears when there is food around so while we try to figure out get professional help get down to the detail is one dog having chronic pain is another dog having you know no secure attachment all this blah blah blah, blah a lot of things to figure out immediate thing is separate the food out that's that's you know on a platform like this i think that would be the best advice i can pass on yeah, I'm just going to actually build off that question from one of the questions that came in the form as well. Um, and this is Shivani Kale, I think, who's asking this question. Um, again, in a multi-dog household, two dogs, it's been a task to understand, incorporate and manage the changes with age. And it's really hard to find studies or otherwise about the same. How does one go about understanding these changes to even address it? So I think uh, Ahana made a good point. We do have a video coming up on this. Uh, and I'll share um, Ahana, uh, Loki and Kitty's as well. Recording. Um, and I think um, uh, my, my recommendation is you're not going to find answers in studies and textbooks. The answers are going to come from reading the dogs, right? Reading specifically what are the changing needs of the dogs. And uh, and like Ahana mentioned earlier, this is so fluid that it will keep changing. So no textbook is going to be able to give you the response there. I think reading the needs of the dogs and working from there is what's going to help. Uh, now I don't have a multi-dog household anymore. It's just Chiru and a bunch of dogs outside that want to come into my home. So maybe one of the other the, the other three of you have multi-dog households. So you should take this one. Yeah, I mean, I think changing dynamics is something that I am experiencing now. With you know, I guess Sammy being in twelve, you know, he's already twelve years with a load of health issues currently, and you know. Um, I'm seeing that Zoe is kind of testing, you know, can she be now the the older one? Because Sammy has always been the older one and like ruling the house, uh, so to say. So I feel like changing dynamics is probably constant in terms of with age, especially when, you know, the, the two dogs are trying to figure out where the other stands. Uh, but I think how to address it if there are any health concerns. I can see that Sammy is struggling, so I know. And I think their entire equation started with, you know, the issue of two dogs having different needs, two dogs having different energies. And again, we are back to the same situation of two dogs having different needs and different energy uh, levels. So I guess I would start off with meeting their individual needs. And, you know, and very important is to kind of be very... Uh, vigilant especially if there are dogs who are getting into escalated or tense situations I guess that's that's quite an important situation and yeah supervision and meeting their individual needs is what I am at right now and that's how I started with both of them as well when we started in multi-dog household as well as now when we have a change in dynamics uh, I think it's focusing on each individual dog is where I am at right now. Yeah, I think a quick one, I think, and I, I made this mistake, right? Um, when our home became a multi-dog household, um, I think the assumption I had was that, oh, because they're together, they will be able to meet all of their needs in this relationship with each other, right? And I very quickly realized that that's not true. Uh, and again, that's not true for, you know, even marriages, right? <laughs> so, I mean, let's, it's, it's really as simple as that. And I think the example that kept coming up for me was, you know, Luchi is definitely much more playful and quite a, quite rambunctious at her play as compared to Mutton. And Mutton just can't stand for it, right? Um, and so I think that we had to look at very much like, I think, um, Sajonio, you mentioned like individual needs, like what is Luchi's individual need? And how can I meet that need outside of this dynamic, right? So does that mean, can I find friends for her outside of this dynamic as opposed to put this kind of pressure uh, on these two to sort of, or on mutton for, 
they have mutton fulfill that need for her um you know so i think that's also something that's been a big learning um in this in this journey yeah yeah okay we have another question how do we reconcile with different humans in the house using different approaches with the dog i have noticed my dog relies more heavily on me to understand what he's communicating but situations escalate when i'm away this is one of our biggest challenges uh oh gosh we are dog experts we don't do so well with humans <laughs> uh, and uh, quite honestly this has remained the challenge repeatedly with people coming in um even back with students the number of meltdowns i, I honestly don't know i think repeatedly i think it it boils down to maybe modeling behavior showing what's possible having those conversations very slowly and uh uh in an incremental way and uh there's so much baggage between two individuals that um it's even even our backbit students struggle with that any of you want to talk about it <laughs> that's actually an issue that i'm having right now because i have a lot of my family members who come at home who are just like you know not familiar with like how to kind of react with loki and how to react with kitty so there's just a lot of tensions and um this may not work for everybody but i think what worked best for me was when i was staying with loki by myself and then that's when we had like the best dynamic but of course that's not really an option that would work for everybody i think the yeah, one I thing think... oh sorry go no no you go ahead um yeah i think my husband and i spar quite a bit uh, on our different approaches uh, to our dogs um and i think what I, i have found helpful is to set what i can't i can't fight all battles um and so i think i set non negotiables right what are what are two three non negotiables that just have to be followed together as a family um and for those two three non negotiables i take the full prep route right so it's like studies here are videos here are stories here are case studies here are experiences uh to really communicate my perspective um but i think i i think that's been really helpful and i've found that with some of those non negotiables if we're also able to talk about changes that we're seeing um i think that belief in in our way of things sort of gets cemented I still have a really long way to go, and and Sindhu is also smiling because she's seen a little bit of this sparring. Um, but but I think that's really helpful. So I would say you know break up the big approach into like non-negotiables and start there and get all the support that you need to be able to communicate that perspective. Okay, shall we move on to the next video because we have three interesting videos I'd hate to miss out on those and some pretty yeah. interesting ones coming up here. Yeah. Since we were talking about multi-dog household, I'll bring up the one that has that story. Hi, I'm Sunil and uh, we have two we have adopted two dogs, uh, Weasley and Potter. so initially uh, potter when we introduced weasley to uh, potter to weasley they were quite fine with each other um until uh, you know um, get to a place where we were a little how can i say overlooking things uh, that's where things started getting a little worse slowly they started getting into tiny tiny fights but there was a point where uh, potter got uh, bitten by another dog uh, when he was on walk so things got uh, took a quite a big u turn there and uh, potter got severely injured and he became so restless and very insecure and his uh, insecurity started pointing out towards weasley where he started uh, attacking weasley or he, st he started getting into a lot of fights uh and he got very scared of even small tiniest things uh, when they got into fights before it was like you know barking barking but this time it was quite worse they started biting each other they started ripping off each other and it's like you know a very aggressive kind of fight 
um, and Weasley got hurt a couple of times. Potter got hurt a couple of times, and it was like uh, I honestly to say I never imagined they would be in the same room together at all. Even when the door was, I I have a video I can share. Uh, when the door is closed itself, they can sense each other, and not the glass doors. I'm talking the uh, you know solid door. Even then, they used to like bark at each other, lunge at each other, and uh, get very angry uh, at each other. It's not, I'm not saying it, it happens overnight, it's a process. But um, uh, it's definitely uh, there is a huge change. Like, uh... what is it they do? <laughs> you want to play with VZ? present it i would say it's wonderful um, but i mean i i know we can't take things for granted but uh definitely a, a huge improvement they sleep on the same sofa beside each other so it is like quite unbelievable they uh, they are able to tolerate not just tolerate they play a lot now uh they they are fine with each other uh and uh, even now they, we are in a place where let's say one one uh, guy is eating uh, something the other weights they don't lunge on them they don't, don't get on them they have they learn to give their space to each other so that is uh, that's the kind of improvement we have now Yeah. What are your thoughts? Uh, I think this is a case study we should maybe take up. I mean, we're planning to do it this month at the auditorium. So those of you who are in the auditorium, you're in for a treat because we're going to definitely do a deep dive on this. I think <clears throat> it's it's a beautiful story, of course. And I think Sunil did a fabulous job. We'll maybe share the full video of of his you know description because he did a fabulous job of explaining the effort that they put into it um where they are today is wonderful uh you know it just brings tears to my eyes what an amazing couple to have you know made this happen and Sajani, you worked with them kudos to you it feels very gutting and it feels like there's no hope um and it's really nobody's fault right that they ended up in that situation like nobody uh, that the, they stuck through and they did this was just amazing. But there was a lot of hard work. They had to keep the two dogs away from each other for nine months or a year. And that's usually how long it takes for you know the, 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 the neurons to connect and reconnect and make changes. And they're, they're you know, reaping the benefits now. But uh, to me, this is a story of two amazing human beings who have really showed up for their dogs in ways that is just absolutely i agree i think the commitment that they've shown through the entire process was amazing right and i think that's that's a, that's saying a lot of again showing up for their dogs i guess uh just being there throughout for their dogs uh and sometimes it's not easy sometimes we have breakdowns also we are you know struggling to manage the entire situation and I think as much as we are helping our dogs to cope with it we are also trying to cope with the entire situation but the transformation is yeah it's one of my favorite you know stories as well so do you want to say something Ahana or you know any questions for us I know we had like a lot of questions around multi-dog households and you know uh, I think there's one thing to obviously point out here that you know transformation can look like conflict resolution can look like two dogs who are friends conflict resolution can look like two dogs who can just walk away uh during you know difficult situations so i think it's great to keep an open mind of what conflict resolution can actually look like and i think uh potter and vz story is a great you know example for me uh in that sense 
Yeah, and I also think what was important is the intermediate videos. He's documented it very well too, which was you know amazing, right? Uh, we don't get documents of these these recordings usually because when things are going bad, nobody has the energy to sit and film it, right? Your your mind is elsewhere, so we're not able to show it that well. So I think what was um, interesting uh, for me about uh, it is the intermediate steps where you saw the one video where there's a baby gate and they both were they just gotten to a place where they were able to look at each other and what was also interesting for me is he he seemed to have a certain kind of acceptance of where they were at he said uh you know honestly i never thought they would be able to be in the same room together and it wasn't he, he seemed like he had made peace with that i think making peace with where they are at at different steps not rushing through and giving them a lot of space and time i think that um uh th th those are the big takeaways for us from this this case is uh, and it's okay don't don't expect don't have this like end image in your mind work with whatever uh you know we have in front of us um Monica is asking me about uh, neural changes in nine to uh, nine months to a year, and quite honestly, it's not something I have too much depth of information on because you know I am not a neuroscientist. Uh, I what I know it to the extent that if you're actually trying to make neural changes for neural plasticity to stick and um, uh for new pathways to get created this is roughly what the time that it takes nine months to a year so if you for instance and with fighting dogs is something that we do is we aim to separate them out somehow separate them out for about a year i usually say that because that's kind of the you know amount that is required and in this case i think it did take that long so i think we really presented the worst case for you but many many of the cases and you know how it is biology is very unique right May, most of the cases we the we see results in much less time it doesn't take one year but i have to present to you the worst case so you know if it really gets that bad where you're ripping each other up uh it's still possible but this uh, difficult 12 months ahead of you yeah um so actually we're getting a um i mean in the form there were a couple of questions around just like socializing dogs with each other um and maybe we can take those um so priya is asking would love to know how to socialize with other dogs all she does is growl at them if i use a long leash um and then she starts fighting and gets bitten this is my concern okay so i think it's uh um again multiple steps multiple things to take care of it's this is what we call multimodal right uh if an individual and, and try to think of this as human beings because we're all social beings so some things are common across all social beings if you're having a challenge with uh just getting along with anybody it's not as simple as okay i take you to a party and i'll leave you there and somehow you'll figure it out no right it could be because you are anything from your having chronic uh, health issues, therefore you just don't like social company. It could be that you have social anxiety. It could be that you haven't learned to deal with others. And so you just never do well in people's company. Uh, it could be that uh, you have been burnt so badly by the people that you have met uh, that uh, you, you're, you have a defensive face that you're bringing into the picture so it could be any of that so i think number one would definitely be to figure out wh where exactly what are things going wrong and with all cases one of the first things i do this is something we talk about at barks all the time empty the cup is what we say what we mean by that is get the dog calmer don't try to deal with the problem at the hardest point first do the groundwork get the dog calmer you cannot have a hyperactive scared nervous dog and then take them to a you know park full of people and say okay let's try and figure it out there that's a band-aid solution that's not what we do we've seen that it never works never gives you long-term solutions so get the dog calmer and we spoke about how to do that earlier you know calmer activities slower activities things to stop things to start so try those things and then uh pay attention i would always introduce dogs to another dog on a one-on-one -on -one basis 
I will vet the other dog. I want to make sure that the other dog is able to handle, you know, where my dog is at in a mental state. For instance, Chiru, after coming here, has a play style that's very different that the dogs here don't like. And uh, not all the dogs can teach her the right play style. There are a few dogs who are very patient with her. Now, those are my best friends, right? <laughs> because they are willing to teach her this very patiently and nicely. The rest of them want to bite her because they don't like what she's doing. So it's like a play date. You know, as a parent, you will handpick who has to spend time with your, your child and it's based on your child's needs. So you find the individual dog that will that will be right for this. It's going to involve trial and error and uh, a very slow approach. We don't go head on. Uh, we work on a very, very slow approach. Look at the dog from a large distance. If, if it looks like you're able to handle, you're not wired up, then we go you know, closer and closer. If it's looking like you're still wired up, you're not able to think through, you're not able to mentally process. Back to the drawing board. Why is this dog not able to handle it is there an underlying health issue you have to get to the bottom of all of that and work through it um so yeah i mean this is very generic stuff you know hopefully you'll understand the process maybe you can try some of these things and then if it's still not working probably it's time for a professional consultation so maybe there's something going on there that uh as a lay person you're not going to be able to see and you'll need a little bit of our help uh, any of you guys want to add something to this Oh, I think we're good. I think, can we, should we take another question or move to another video? Uh, there's a question here, right? Do you want to take yeah. that? Any of you want to take yeah. it? I'm talking a lot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sajana, I'm going to give this to you. Can you define dog socialization? Different dogs need different kinds. My one dog wants to eat everyone while the other one chooses. Yeah, I think uh, this boils down to what Sindur mentioned about probably. Um, oh, sorry, she met she met my one dog wants to meet everyone while the other one chooses. Okay, that that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, again when when multiple dogs have different needs, I guess you have to meet those needs differently. Uh, I don't think trying to have the same solution for different dogs with different socialization needs, personalities, uh, also threshold to the kind of social, you know, uh, socialization, I guess. Uh, I, I think that is kind of important. And if, again, what kind of so socialization, quality of socialization, because we, we hear about socialization in a very different way in the dog world. Uh, but we humans know, right, like not all of us have the same capacity to socialize we don't have the same way of socializing we all have different uh capacities energy uh personality types or you know choose the kind right kind of you know uh people to socialize with so i guess a lot of these things go into uh deciding uh how you would socialize so i guess socialization would just mean meeting the dog social needs i guess if you ask me to define dog socialization i would would you say anything else would be about defining it but i guess if you're not if you're trying to figure out how to socialize firstly i guess if your dog is too wired up or unable to really make those choices for themselves the first step is really to get your a dog to be in a place to say i want this or i don't want this no i don't think i want to add anything to that <laughs> pretty much summed it up so i think we're good anna do you want uh, to yeah yeah uh i think just to say that socialization can just look different for like different sets of dogs like we often tend to think it's like you know dog one is playing with dog two but for some dogs it may be they're just able to exist family in the same place or just like sniff together or just you know we like like how Porter and Weasley were able to just like nap on the same couch so I don't think there will be like a fixed kind of definition of an end goal that we'd see with socialization. I think what you said about meeting the dog's specific social needs is an interesting one. And for people to think about what may be the social need of my dog. And again, because we are all social beings, it's worth thinking about how each of our social needs are different. What is your social need versus mine? That's an interesting conversation to have. Um, for instance, for me, my social need is often uh, not 
I do not like partying in a club with 10 people like that is not my idea of that is not my social need. I come back exhausted. I have to prep for it. It is not pleasant. It's not meeting any need. It's me pushing myself to meet a social obligation, but it's not meeting my need. Uh, my need is to have few close friends sit with PJs. I don't even like to change. I want to sit in comfortable PJs with a glass of wine, you know, sit on the couch. Uh, and uh, I have a friend around here. Her social need is to go on uh, beautiful drives and uh, treks and she likes to walk. And that is not my need. And we figured it out. And so she's like, you know, she meets you know random people and she goes and that's she she meets a social need that way mine is i need to know these people very well only then i like to meet them i need to be able to have specific kind of conversation only so i think there's so much variation so thinking like this about dogs as well uh what is the need and then i think how do we meet that need is an interesting one and if the dog is not able to then go back to the drawing board and figure out why Spurti's story is, she's put up a thing and we love it. Spurti, your story is also coming up. We can't wait to <laughs> share that with you too. Yeah. Um, shall, shall we go ahead and take that story then? Shall we take Prithvi's story? Yeah. Just before we do that, quick reminder to everybody um, to take photos of the event. Um, and I've, I'm posting the tags and the hashtags that you need to use when you post are uh, to be able to sort of avail your special goodies. Um, so yeah, just a reminder of that. Cool, Sajana. Okay. So I'm going with Pippi's story. And I guess those of you who are very emotional may need some tissues, uh, I guess. Uh, a great one. Um, I'm Spurti Raman, and um, I am, and I have uh, a dog. Uh, you know, he comes from the streets of Bangalore. I used to think he's an indie, but I am now kind of, you know, not really sure uh, whether he's a mixed breed or an actual, you know, indie pariah dog. So he used to stay in the same street that we were in, and um, he just randomly one day showed up in our house because our compound was so, like, you know, very small that he could just leap over. He had like 42 scars all over his body when we first met him. So we, we've we heard really gory stories about it. Uh, like uh, we were told that he was um, burnt by people. He was like, you know, uh, branded and things like that. And those scars look like it. Uh, so we've, these are just stories we've heard. But what we have also seen is people actually beating him, people trying to run him over with their vehicles. And uh, over time, or maybe this is something that he, this is something his his way of defending himself was to like chase vehicles because even to this day he is terrified of motorcycles. Like whatever we do, he just he you can see that fear in his eyes. So he's so so terrified. So you can imagine when he was on the streets in Bangalore, there are like a hundred motorcycles that pass each particular day, right? So he was his response to that was chasing them and sometimes he has had uh, a lot of bite history as well so he he would bite people uh, in the motorcycles if they wouldn't stop or wouldn't slow down or you know things triggered in him and he would bite but it got to a point where the bbmp landed in front of our house and they were like we're going to take away the dog and they're like if you if you don't want us to take us you have to keep the dog yourself like like keep it as your pet and i'm like that was like an instant for us to decide a 15 year long commitment and I didn't blink an eye to say yes. And since then, he's been our dog. So with all the past, you know, in the initial days, um, people were still despising this because he would bark. He would bark like crazy whenever a vehicle passed by our street. So um, every single time there was a bike that passed in front of our house, he would bark. Uh, and he was just not trusting of anybody except us. So um, he has bitten a few people after we have adopted without seeming triggers. I mean, I understand what triggers are now, but at that point in time, we were like, what is happening? Why is he biting people like this? And uh, there is nobody he would trust. And of course, it is, you know, also because of the trauma or uh, whatever he's gone through in the past. But, but, but we were like, okay, what did we like really sign up for? Is this something that we can do? We want to do? 
And added to that, I forgot to mention about reacting to other dogs. So he was really good friends with very, very few street dogs, absolutely no pet dogs. And uh, he had like, he had gotten into wars with these dogs. Even after we adopted, he <laughs> he harbored that, you know, vengeance or whatever. He actually bit a dog, like a street dog, with so much vengeance right in front of our eyes. We were super helpless. The fact that we moved, before we moved, I think more than me and my husband, uh, my parents and my husband's parents were super worried about how would we take a dog like this into a country where if a dog bites anybody, the dog is going to be put down, right? So it's it's a lot at stake. In Bangalore, we can somehow rationalize with people, somehow, you know, uh, stand up to things and say, he's our dog or whatever, like the way we did with Pippi. But then here, you are an immigrant. And then on top of it, you have a dog like this who's biting people. It can escalate really bad. And you could be liable. Your dog would be put down. The stakes are super high. So we were we were obviously lost, and that's my main motivation to you know go sign up for one hundred and one. So um so how he is right now? Like now he's gone for a walk. We don't have any you know troubles with um taking him out for a walk because uh when he's on his footpath to the pavement, uh he just doesn't bother what's on the road. And today he just walks up to anybody with a wagging tail and gets all his pets. So we are not worried about, oh, would he bite them or would he react to them or anything? He chooses who he wants to talk and that's pretty much everybody here. Uh, with dogs, unfortunately, when, when we were in, still in Bangalore, when we were in the middle of, you know, move and all that, he made a lot of streety friends. At one point, he had like 40, 40 streety friends uh, in different parts of the street that we would take him to. And he would like speak to, like talk and interact with everybody uh, here. So oh, because there are no street dogs, unfortunately, um, he tried to make friends with coyotes, you know, polyfting, talking to them and all that, which was hilarious. <laughs> and um, of course, the coyotes, we didn't want anyway to be go near them. And they were just sweet and they were on their own. And we were like, Pipi, this is not a dog. Uh, but um, he, the, the fact that he tried to communicate with them was interesting for us. Um, and a lot of pet dogs here, do not have or or i should say the pet parents do not have an understanding of natural dog behavior that we are fortunate to see with pippi so uh, a lot of them don't even probably know how to communicate so he's very very wary of that such dogs there are some dogs however like you know mexican rescue dogs or things like that and he's happy to talk to them i also remember somebody came to my house like a neighbor he had she had seen pippi Pippi and his ways before he was adopted. And she came to me and she's like, Pippi has calmed down so well and is, is such a good dog right now. Could you tell me what you did so that I can do it for my son? And I was like, oh my God, you should go to 101. And touch wood, no bites ever, ever for so many years. Whatever be the situation, whoever he's confronted with, um, no bites. Uh, dogs or people or whatever. Uh, so we, we're super happy with that part. And yeah, he's, 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 like whoever meets him, they're like, oh, he's such a good boy, such an obedient boy. He's not jumping on people. He's not like, you know, typical uh, pet dog behavior. Uh, so people are super happy to kind of have him around. Uh, and we're happy to see that because we were at a stage, we were like, he'll be put down the moment we are going to land here. <laughs> Uh, and to see that he's really won people's heart um, is, you know, sometimes it makes us proud and sometimes it wells up our eyes. It's it's like we're just happy the way it's turned out and we're so proud of what he, he as a, you know, a dog that's come from a past like that has been able to achieve in today's world. Uh, for me, this is again a very, very touching one because when I saw, I heard Spurti talk about Pippi, but I did one of our 101 classes at that time. I were doing it in person and I did it in their house and I saw Pippi and I saw the scars and I just, my heart went out to him. I was just like uh, a dog who's been through that. For if you can turn around, come around, learn to trust again. Uh, it gives me a lot of hope that dogs are capable of letting go of a lot 
and trusting despite what has been done to them, no matter how bad it is. So I think it's a, it's just an extraordinary story of uh, hope uh, and what dogs, how resilient dogs are. Um, I think it also kind of highlights a lot of things that we've been talking about, about how, you know, uniquely different their needs are um, and the, 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 the journey, the way this journey goes. And I think it answers a lot of the questions on socialization that were asked as well. Uh, you know, very critical, important one with socialization is also the other dog. It may not be the problem with your dog. A lot of pet dogs communicate so poorly on the leash. It's not your dog's fault. Uh, frequently, I feel like Chiro is not the one at fault. She's very good at communication. A lot of pet dogs don't do that very well with, um, uh, and so she has a very low tolerance level. Um, and I think that's also something to keep in mind is, you know, we don't, we try to normalize this. Hi, I want to meet you. No signals, no hi, no hello. Just running up to people and, you know, jumping on other dogs. And that is normal as far as we are concerned. And we expect that if our dogs don't accept that, then our dog is the problem. Uh, whereas I think it's quite the contrary. Uh, uh, Chiru growls at these dogs and I think her communication is pretty good. She's basically saying, sorry, that kind of thing doesn't work here. Uh, and I don't think there's a problem with Chiro. I don't think it's a need for socializing her. It's I think it's a need for the other dogs to learn how to communicate. And so we can take it a little easy. We don't have to put all the burden on our, our dogs uh, in that sense. So you can see the complexity uh, that goes into, you know, social interactions. And I think this is a very interesting one. And thank you so much, Purti, for sharing that you're with you with us today. It's just, um, it's, it's a, constant reminder for me of why I do what I do. It's one of the most powerful stories. Okay, I am going to take a few questions that are coming up. Um, okay, so one of them is, can you elaborate on leash etiquette, please? People barge into my dog's space and it's a battle to make them understand. Sajana? Sajana? <laughs> um, I wonder if it's it's easy to kind of get other people to get to understand. I guess it's, it's it's the hardest part of the job, which is you know get people to see and understand and you know help them change their mindset about be it socialization, be it you know uh, leash etiquette for that matter, or calming your dogs down, or the fact that your dog doesn't appreciate it. I guess a few things that I started doing with my dog because Sammy was you know a very hyper dog on leash and the great thing was that every other dog that he was getting hyper around was another pet dog on leash and you know it was such a hyper hyper situation every time and so I just you know stopped going around that time because I knew that I was getting stressed Sammy was getting hyper the entire situation was very hard to handle and I think uh that also helped Sammy not to have that many hyper interactions and also that, you know, we don't bump into situations where we're having to talk to people and say, please, you know, get your dog away. I remember there was, a, you know, two such incidents where, you know, we ended up in a situation where another dog was also very hyper around another dog and we had to like from the other end of, you know, the, the pathway be like, you know, please can you, you know, walk the other way and we had to walk the other way. So it's very hard when you're walking and it just doesn't, meet the need of the walk at all right it, it just doesn't serve the purpose of the walk at all so we just stopped getting into that situation repeatedly because it was kind of required for our sanity and the sanity of Sammy and over time I guess it helped uh, for us and I think the other thing that we can do is just get other people to see how our dogs are you know over a period of time and then just realize that they might need some kind of help or they're interested in a conversation about this because I feel like a lot of this this can be a very conflicting situation. Uh, what do you say? Yeah, I lie a lot <laughs> <laughs> when in these situations. I, you know, I, when people try to bring their dog near my dog, I used to say, no, my dog is blind. She can't handle other dogs. Uh, she was isn't uh and then my dog is scared she can't handle other dogs she isn't uh but i just all kinds of things um and uh, i just avoid social contact if i don't know what the other dog is like if i uh basically what i want to tell them is <laughs> your dog is not 
polite you and you have not helped your dog be there but that's obviously not a conversation i want to have and so it's just avoidance and it's interesting we're coming back like full circle right because we spoke yeah. about avoidance right at the beginning and avoidance and the beautiful thing about avoidance is the more effort i put into avoiding the situation for my dogs my dogs quickly learn this is another way of showing up right it's a great example of showing up which is i am willing to avoid a situation that is likely to be difficult for you and so my dog learns that this is possible so when she sees a situation that she thinks is going to get out of hand she turns and looks at me with this hello are we going to do something about it shall we run uh, shall we go and i'm like yeah i mean if you want to go we go i also have a lot of i put a lot of thought uh into uh, the situations i get myself into so for instance if i'm going to be out on the streets i always have my car with me often we don't move very far away from the car and i have the you know boot of my car open and a ramp there and my dog chiru she any of you have seen her know this you know the slightest thing that gets her afraid and she before anybody i know what happened she's just run into the car and people are like where did your dog go and i'm like ah, chances are she's in the car and sure enough should have run into the car um outside my house again i keep the gate open so that she can run in um again it's a i let's see if i can uh, catch that video and send it where uh, she's trying to meet a new dog she's getting a little nervous and i have the gate open and she knows very well mum shows up for me so she knows that if i go into that gate that kid shuts behind me and all the other bully dogs can't come that is what we mean by showing up right she knows that there is the safe space mom always has a safe space for me and worst case you know you can come behind me and stand and i will defend you you know body on the line my body on the line right so she has learned these things but for all that there's been a lot of sensitizing in in the earlier years which is to say that i am willing to walk away from the situations you know i am not going to subject you or me to this and if i have to lie that you know <laughs> whatever whatever i have to come up with uh, i will come up with go to the other end of the road road walk in the middle of the night uh, walk in the, you know extremely odd hours walk in places where nobody else walks so it could be you know a construction site a parking lot anything anything that i have to do so that i do not have to put them in not in the beginning when we are when your dog is still learning maybe at a later point they can handle it a little better but in the beginning they really need that space so that they can you know their brains can <laughs> develop rewire they can think and they can ha- handle challenges that come one at a time right don't don't like bombard me with it one at a time i can handle this and they can they can build that muscle so so to say that social muscle can be built uh, without overwhelming them yeah so spurti is also saying the same thing going for walks we, yeah we are all like night owls we all like little thieves right all of us like step out look left look right somebody is there run back into the house <laughs> we can, can be quite odd that way <laughs> yeah i think three things that i just want to add to that and like like daily i think which is now become like daily habit of walking with my dogs i think one is you know like fairly like scanning the environment right um and so if i see that you know another dog is coming in the same direction or children are coming in the same direction or you know one is i have the advantage of two slightly larger dogs so people are in general are not or not keen on sort of approaching us but even and then if there are humans who really want to approach us then it's like looking out and then taking a different route different direction like moving away completely um i think <laughs> that that's definitely one thing i think the other one that i actually uh, <laughs> this is the one that i was very awkward about because i just felt like it's so weird to do it but it served me really well which is if i see someone coming and i'm not able to sort of unfortunately i have to move in the same direction then it's literally giving a stop signal to them and saying okay let me pass and then you come close Uh, and i've done that with people with walking dogs i've done that with people and children specifically um and i think the third which is an escalation of this is if they don't understand the signal is to say can you please just wait uh, can you please not come close and can you please just wait um that definitely works uh and so yeah i think these are definitely three things that we we i i do quite religiously um okay should we 
do the next video or should we take two more questions i think we have one more video right yeah we yeah, have yeah. one okay, more so video so is there any how many yeah. more questions do we have uh we have quite a, quite a couple of them and some of them are slightly longish if we don't so get to it this time we can always get to it in the next yeah, uh, yeah, session yeah 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 done 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 cool okay so shall i just play the next one okay working i guess okay i'm bhuvanna i have two dogs so goose we got her when she was about 45 days old or 50 days old when she was a puppy uh, byra had lived on the street for some time and we suspect him to be a breeder discard uh, he we think he's a belgian shepherd or belgian malinois goose has more of an anxious uh, personality she tends to be a little bit more jumpy a little bit more uh, uh, jerky alert and all that uh, well she was my first dog also so lot of things i did not know how to uh, go about bring up a dog and and there are a lot of uh, advices out there that's time a dozen and uh, time out and things like that none of that it's like it only made her more agitated the worst advice was you know separation anxiety you need to ignore the pup till it uh, till the pup stops crying when you come back it just didn't make sense i even attended a, a uh a primer workshop kind of a thing a question and answer session and the, the treats didn't work i mean it's like it just didn't work and it it felt also tedious uh, and two months after having gone home byra joined us and when byra joined us he was a big dog so there was this huge dog right and uh, a lot of fights would break out between goose and byra and uh, a goose did not like him in the house in the same room as me trying to lay claim to me as well uh food fights would break out it's like I, i the whole thing you know the pack needs to eat together nonsense was also there and uh and then they ended up sleeping in my room and both of them would end up uh, like breaking into fights in the room so so i was averse to all training methods and trainers in general because it was a lot of nonsense advice is what i felt it was i i was like it may be working for people but it doesn't work for my dogs no. and so this friend of mine even when we got goose as a puppy uh he had mentioned about sindur's uh, training and it's like why don't you just get in touch with the person see what goes and i was like no nah, 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 i decide no trainer that's so thankfully uh sindur's book came out and then this friend said why don't you just get the book and see if that's something uh it's, it's a good book just read it i was like ha huh, book why not so i like you know you read so many books why not one then of course once you started reading dog knows it's like so i'm i'm a therapist so i work with people so my approach to working with people is creating space for people to learn and grow and change and all that so Sindur's book resonated with me, and that's when I was like, "Oh, this feels very different." Now it's just play. For, I mean, it's it's play. There's no fights really. Going at her throat. I haven't seen it happen. I don't even know after that. After the that stint, I don't know when it happened. Yeah, so I think the case was more of two dogs getting into fight, and I think there was a lot of separation anxiety for one of the dogs. And since I've worked with Bhuvana, there's also a lot of like leash pulling, and I know Bira would get into like a lot of difficult situations in the walks as well. So I guess that was all the background information to that case. And uh, yeah, anything that you would want to add? Yeah, I think this was an interesting one, and the reason I think this was, it's maybe it's a really good note to also kind of close the session on is that this is a work in progress case, right? So we can, I think, continue to monitor it, and when we get updates, you know, maybe we'll have future sessions also where we talk about what did you try, what did you, you know, where where are we at? Because um, you know, in a very short span of time, we've kind of tried to fit in the highlights of this, but there are still a lot of issues. And Saujana, you're working with them. Um, um, I know Bona has done one hundred and one, and now she's doing private consults with you. Um, 
but uh, you know again there's a lot of work involved it's slow progress you're not going to see these flashy walk in and you know i will do magic like this and you know we'll walk out and things will happen like that doesn't happen and it, it a lot of things that we work on look unrelated but it produces results at the end of it um, slowly sometimes it's not even noticeable so to me i think this was a lovely story of somebody who is again trying so hard i really love the people at bugs because they try so hard never give up um and uh, yeah i think i would definitely recommend that for the ponder club this is this should be a case that you guys follow more closely uh, the ups and the downs as honestly as possible you know it's interesting you said uh, there's so many things that you're trying and they're all little things and you may not even realize that they're all connected or you know what you're doing also is something that you don't know sometimes and this was my conversation with Bhuvana and you know one of the times and she, she's like you know this is magic and we were talking about some you know situation on box and vet visit and I was like what did you do and she's like good question I don't know what I did but you know when we think about it in background there is so much going on in, in the entire sm seemingly small seemingly unrelated things but when you put together you tend to see how all of it fits together any questions yeah. for us? I've, yeah. I've, I've heard that a lot. I used to have, hear that a lot during consultations because they would come back the second session and suddenly they have a new like a new dog right <laughs> like they've traded in the old dog and you and and in the beginning that when I was working I wanted feedback so I would be like what did you do I mean of all the things that I said what did you actually try I'd like to know you know for my and most of them would be like I don't know what I did <laughs> um, and and now now I, I know, I, I know I can see the big picture, so I know. But yeah, it often feels a little strange and not sure what we did to make that happen. Yeah. So um, shall we take one of the questions? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was actually thinking a little bit about, uh, Sadhul, what you were talking about, multi-dog households, um, a couple of videos ago, right? Which is sometimes it is just taking out the most obvious triggers, just removing the most obvious triggers you know, that makes such a huge difference. And um, I think just a couple of days ago, my husband was remarking it. Oh, it's been such a long time since, you know, the dogs have gotten into a bit of a, you know, fight. And then obviously I went just touching all wood. And then I was like, wait, wait, wait. It's not just touching wood. There's a lot of things that we've actively done. Um, and I think a big, big part of that has just been remove the triggers, right? Some of them are really obvious and then some of them are very specific to the dogs together. Um, and so I, I, I think that's just, that's really helpful. Um, okay. All right. So let's look at some questions. I think we can take one or two depending on the questions. Um, Okay, so this is um, a three who is saying that her dog was uh, either abandoned or was a free living dog. Uh, the place where they stay now has around 25 free, free living dogs. Um, her dog is fine with every single one of them except for two dogs. Both are female dogs, Melon and Baki. Baki barks at her generally whenever she sees her. That's why... Mupa's reaction, who's a three's dog, with her goes with barking sometimes and sometimes she ignores it. Mupa's real issue is with Melon. Melon doesn't bark at her. Mostly we see her giving calming signals, yawning, turning her face to a side. But Mupa's reaction towards her from the beginning was always very feisty. She pulls us, becomes agitated, added with snarling and barking. We've tried hand signals, yawning or calling her, like, calling her with a whistle-like sound. Sometimes nothing works at all. It becomes very stressful for us and her both. She does the same thing when she sees and hears a bike with loud noise passing by. We can understand because she has stayed on the street. She has trauma. But I want to know how can we give her that comfort and assurance that the bike will not do anything. If I know how, we will be able to address this issue for her. So I think there are two things together in the, in the question. Yeah. Um. Again, I think this is very, very specific. So it's it's going to be difficult to handle mm -hmm. it on this session. Um, one thing I would suggest is maybe one of the other sessions, future sessions we have, you can pick up a question like this and like really, you know, pull yeah. it apart and see what you can do. Um, 
uh, and usually uh, with the lunging and things like that, uh, my first go-to is space, create more space, react sooner, react faster. You see them at a distance. If they've already started kind of, uh, that means it's already gotten to a point where they can't handle it anymore. They're, you know, they're not able to handle the situation that they're in. So how do we avoid that for a certain period of time? Right. It's it's not, uh, you know, forever situation for a certain period of time. How do we avoid the situation till the dog is able to regulate slow reintroduction, look at each other from a distance um, uh, and, you know, get them to be able to share space. Uh, but for that, you need a certain period of time when they're like not exposed to the trigger and the bike again, it's, it's a very difficult one to answer. I think Spurti touched upon it. Uh, her dog still has issues, but uh, it takes time. But what I think one of the interesting things that struck to me with Spurti's case uh, was uh, when I went to her house, uh, the the there was repeated exposure to the trigger because the bikes were kind of going right in front of the gate. And she mentions in her story that, you know, they had a relatively low compound. So I asked her to kind of... Um, cover the gate and through the gate the dog could see what was going on so cover that visual barriers um, that by itself does not necessarily fix things but that gives a little respite it reduces that overexposure to the trigger so something of that kind where you know there are some ways in which you can do something to reduce the overexposure and then like you know do something give the dog some space and then start working um, I think that might help so of course, if 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 you do a private consult, it's definitely one of those cases that you can bring into the uh, the tip was so transformational. PP is so visually stimulated. Yeah, many dogs are very visually stimulated, and particularly Indies. Indies are extremely visually stimulated more than you know the other breeds that we see. So cutting off that visual contact for them uh, can make a really big difference. So that's kind of what I'd like to say. Um, I don't know if we have time to do a deeper dive on it. Any brief, anything that you guys want to add? Okay. Um, okay. So Aparna is asking what could be the different ways or means to which dogs seek to establish connection with us? That's so cute. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think different dogs do it differently. Uh, Chiru, I've seen her do so many things. So I think primary thing that dogs do that's so in their DNA is those eyes. Those eyes where you say, I'll sell my soul to you kind of a thing. And again, there are lots of studies that talk about it too, um, about how they evolved to have those eyes. And you look into those eyes, you're releasing all kinds of silly chemicals in your body that uh, makes you say, okay, I'll give you anything. So the, the, all this is science. Um, but there are so many other ways they can vocalize and ask, they can paw you. And Chiru has a very, very cute way of asking, particularly when she wants food from me. Is she puts her face on the sofa like this, not looking at me, looking away. And she'll put her face like this and wait. And she's looking at me from the corner of her eye and waiting. And for some reason, she has learned that that helps her. So I think, uh, yeah, there can be many, many ways. These, these are uh, Chiru's ways. You guys want to add anything? Yeah, Luchi is a whiner. So she, so she does two things, actually. One is she'll just come and stare at me. Or the other is she will whine. Um, and Martin's very straightforward. Hers is just a paw. And then you are stuck for the next 20 minutes. You cannot move. Um, it is an intense petting session and you must pet everything consistently. So, yeah. I think Zoe is... Um... Just come and sit on your lap, kind of a dog. Uh, it, it doesn't matter who. Like, I think that has become her greeting way also. Like, you know, when we when she sees new people, and that's an observation I made recently. She used to be scared of men initially. And now uh, when there are even like strangers coming home, like guests and all that, she actually would want to go sit on their lap and like get pet completely. Um, so that is, I think, Zoe's way. She would... and touch and sit like no matter what touch and sit till she's like you know satisfied with like okay fine I'm done now I'll go to the room and sleep now that kind of a dog I think Sammy is very I'll come when I want to I'll get a couple of pets and it's just 
eye contact you miss the eye contact you lost the opportunity of you know uh that connection bit so it took a while for us to realize that he's asking in such a subtle manner that just come look at you in fact just walk look at you and then walk away if you're not like listening so yeah that's that's very different and again sammy doesn't have he's very minimal in his need for like you know the connection with others so he'll come get pet uh petted and then you know all of that and interact with you and then just go back and then do his own thing but what he doesn't like though is if zoe is getting the attention around that the, you know when there is there are people who are home or that you know we are playing with her or touching her connecting with her he just doesn't appreciate if we are losing out on him so i guess that would be his yeah need for, for connection and how he asks for it Okay, so with that, we uh, are very, very close to the end of our live event. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, I think we wanted to just close with a couple of updates. Um, so, Sindhu, do you want to do that? And then and I can just send in a reminder for the tagging and the special goodies once more. Yeah, sure. So I think uh, the big update for us is uh, Surabhi has graduated. <laughs> so we have one more consultant uh, available for private consultations. Um, uh, and uh, uh, she's based out of Delhi, but we do online consultations because as you can see, a lot of what we do is not actually standing there and telling the dog this and this. So it works. Uh, and Saujani, of course, has been working for a while. Uh, the uh, second thing is um, we have a library uh, that is finally up on our website. I'll share the link. So there, there are a lot of good resources that we have added there. So I'll share that and we will be updating it on an ongoing basis. Um, you guys can watch it uh, and watch the content. Um, yeah, I think those were the two main updates for me. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to make as much of this available as possible for you guys to catch up on. Uh, we'll do more events. And uh, the idea is, you know, you have access to all of this and can work through it. Yeah, I think one last um, update was that we're thinking of our next uh, Ponder event around the 28th of May. Um, and so, again, we'll share details of what that would be, uh, timings, etc. But I think we can give a little bit of a snippet into what we're thinking of discussing. Uh, Ahana, do you want to do that? Okay, Sajanya, do you want to share what we're going to be discussing in our next event? Yeah, I think the most recent development in the world of dog industry, dog behavior, dog training is the ban on the shock collar. Uh, very politely known as e-collar, uh, I guess. And we want to just discuss what are our thoughts about a shock collar and just, yeah, break it down uh, on our perspectives. Maybe use studies, maybe use, you know, our own experiences and we'll see. Yeah, when you said maybe use, I was like, use what? <laughs> <laughs> We're not shocking anybody on camera. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, studies, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool.